Tonight, we are turning our attention to the U.S. border because in just a couple of days, actually Thursday to be exact, Title 42 restrictions are ending. It's a public health services law that has allowed the government to prevent migrants from crossing the southern border. And the Trump administration said it was to limit the spread of COVID-19. So since March of 2020, millions of migrants were sent home or returned to Mexico under that policy. But now that the pandemic emergency is coming to a close on Thursday, so do these limitations at the border. Now, as many as 10,000 migrants are expected to cross into America every day. We know that Sacramento, of course, has a huge population of immigrant and refugee communities. So our Becca Habegger has a deeper look on what this all means for our area, right, Becca? Yeah, you know, Alex, first things first, just because Title 42 was ending doesn't mean all those migrants will be allowed into the U.S. Now, the Biden administration is replacing Title 42 with some policies they hope will deter people from trying to cross. And we'll get to that. But first, we want to talk with people with a personal connection to this topic. On the steps of the California Capitol Tuesday morning, the annual Immigrant Day of Action brought together advocates and those who have been through the process themselves. I'm here to show that our lives do matter. Jose Hernandez is a legal permanent resident whose parents brought him from Mexico to the U.S. when he was three. They're escaping uh, poverty, uh, violence, and oppression. Uh, so they wanted a better future for us to get a better education here in America. He and others here are watching to see what will happen once Title 42 expires, when the U.S. will no longer be able to cite COVID protections as a reason for expelling migrants before they have an opportunity to apply for asylum. There's already a lot of anxiety about, you know, is this going to um, increase uh, exponentially border crossings, right? And what is the administration going to do about it? From the advocacy side, our position on this is the right to asylum is a right. It is protected under international law. In place of Title 42, the Biden administration is enacting other policies it hopes will deter people from coming to the border. For example, a new rule requires migrants at the southern border to first apply for asylum in a country they travel through on their way to the U.S. If they don't, the U.S. will deny them asylum here. Critics point out that severely limits who will be allowed in and favors Mexican migrants over other Latin American migrants since Mexicans don't pass through another country to get to the U.S. border. Federal officials argue they had to do something as they expected illegal border crossings to climb to as many as 13,000 per day if Title 42 ended with no extra rules in place. Also, the Biden administration is asking migrants to use the CBP-1 app, which allows migrants to make an appointment in a U.S. point of entry instead of presenting themselves at the border. But critics say the rollout has been clunky and the few appointments get snapped up almost immediately. And we should note federal officials say this week they did just make recent improvements to that app and added more appointments. Now, I spoke on the phone today with a volunteer attorney and organizer with NorCal Resist. That's a local grassroots organization whose work includes supporting asylum seekers. She says her organization is expecting to see an uptick in people in the Sacramento region who need help with food and housing, as well as help with their asylum application. She added there's a lot of change and therefore a lot of confusion right now, too. And Becca, it's also important to note that we're not just talking about migrants from Latin American countries, right? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, this organizer pointed out to me that uh, with NorCal Resist, look, the, the Sacramento region, for example, it's home to a huge population of Slavic and Afghan refugees, among others. Uh, the ending of Title 42 and potential confusion it brings about what comes next affects anyone coming to the U.S. to seek asylum, no matter their country of origin. Alex? All right, Becca, thank you so much. And we also want to know your thoughts on the issue. What do you think California can do to improve immigration policies? All you have to do is just scan that QR code on the side of your screen, or you already know, you can always text us at 916-321-3310. All right, a New York jury has found former President Donald Trump liable for sexual abuse in an attack from nearly three decades ago. The verdict announced today awards E. Jean Carroll $5 million. She testified that she had a chance encounter with Trump back in 1996 at a department store, and then she said that things turned violent inside of a dressing room. Trump's lawyers say that the claims are made up. There is still no suspect in a shooting that left one person dead in Antelope. Sacramento County deputies say it happened last night around 9 p.m. in the area of Fawn Hollow Way and Firestone Way. The Sacramento Sheriff's Office says that the victim and his girlfriend came across the suspect who was in a dark colored sedan. The suspect then shot the victim, causing him to crash into a parked car. 
The victim died at the scene, and it's still not clear what led up to that encounter. But about a half hour before the shooting, a woman in the same neighborhood called 911 to report suspicious devices with exposed wires that she found between her home and a neighbor's home. And the bomb squad found that the devices were live and potentially dangerous. They took them to another location for further inspection. All right, and Sacramento sports teams are on fire this year. After making it to the finals in the U.S. Open Cup last year, Sac Republic is looking to finish the job. And they are hosting another MLS club tonight at Sutter Health Park. And Kevin John is there ahead of the match that's just at 7.30. I mean, Kevin, this is really big for Sacramento, right? Oh, this is a huge deal, not just for the club, but for the city of Sacramento. You have a USL team, Sacramento Republic FC, taking on an MLS slide. Like you said, Colorado Rapids here in the U.S. Open Cup, round of 32. It's a big deal, but of course, you know what's bigger than this? The smell of food out here. As you can kind of see around me, you'll see people filing in right now. I would say there's a few hundred people already in here right now. You, can, you guys can't smell the food through the screen, but I can tell you right now, it smells oh so good. Now, we're going to keep on walking over this way. And while we're walking, I'll tell you a little bit more about this match. So the team they're taking on, Colorado Rapids, they have actually not lost a match since March. So, of course, they're on a little bit of a hot streak. But keep in mind, Sacramento Republic FC, they are undefeated on the season as well. And they're definitely not scared to take on an MLS opponent. By for, for call it out loud, they remember they beat three last year on the way to the U.S. Open Cup final. Now this right here, as you can see, is Heart Health Park. I'll get my big big head out of the way so you can take a look here. But uh, as you see, the field they're getting ready for it. You'll see uh, people, uh, you know, so a few players out there stretching, getting loose, getting ready to go. We have our event staff right here in front of us. They are excited to go. So, you know, of course, expect these stands out here to be filled with thousands of fans once 730 hits. Of course, that's when this match does start. Now, if Republic FC happens to win tonight, they will move on to the round of 16. And keep in mind, there's only a handful of USL clubs left in this tournament. So for Republic FC to make it this far is incredible. And if they can keep on going, you'll see a lot of excitement like we did last year when they made it to the Cup final. In the meantime, we are about 45 minutes away from a uh, kickoff here at the uh, Heart Health Park, and I'm sure these stands behind me will be rumbling and filled with excitement once 730 hits. Kevin's got his sleeves up, so you know he means business out there. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Coming up next, shorthanded nurses brought their demands to the state capitol today. What changes they want to see to provide quality and I'm still tracking showers and thunderstorms in the Sierra, plus the big heat for our Mother's Day weekend. And still to come, as the Sacramento Fire Department deals with accusations of racism, the city could require new equity and diversity training. I think it's important for our current electeds and even future elected officials to be aligned with the internal work and the external work that we're doing around race and gender and equity. How leaders are working to embrace the title of one of the most diverse cities in the U.S. We're back after this. Well, uh, you never know. It's the second week of May with how it looks up in the Sierra. Still a whole lot of snow at Sierra at Tahoe Resorts. I mean, some resorts are saying that they're going to stay open until July. Yeah, just a couple. I mean, honestly, it's Palisades, Tahoe and Mammoth. So you definitely want to check ahead. Don't plan on heading up to all of those resorts up there. But a beautiful sight nonetheless. Still tracking showers and thunderstorms in this year. So more fresh powder coming in just as soon as it seems like we melt some of it off. More comes in. Isolated thunderstorms around Palisades at Tahoe. Most of that is falling just south of Highway 50, where you can see it extends far into the central Sierra here. Isolated thunderstorms just up the hill from Arnold, Sonora, and Murphy's. We'll be tracking that through tonight. As far as our temperature trend on the way up here, out of the 60s into the 70s, we've been sitting with that cool showery pattern for quite some time. Average high 79 degrees. We're going to be a little bit closer to that by Thursday and then get into the 80s quickly after that into the 90s. Tonight, though, beautiful conditions. Our sunset, 8.05. Temperatures holding in the 60s through 9 p.m. Our forecast low at 49, pretty close to that average low. Sunrise is actually not 6.08. It's actually at 5.59. So this is going to be the time of year that we're now starting to see an earlier sunrise, longer period of daylight. And with that building ridge of high pressure, the sinking, warming air, 
we get warm very quickly. Highs tomorrow in the 50s for the Sierra, 60s and 70s down the hill. With 50s along the coast, but once we head inland, we're right back into the 70s. It's going to be a warmer uh, pattern that's shaping up over the course of the next five days, certainly for our region-wide forecast by the weekend, Mother's Day weekend. Highs will be in the 60s for the mountains, hills, 80s, 70s for the coast. And a look at that 10-day forecast. We've got highs in the mid to upper 90s in some places Saturday and Sunday, staying warm into next week with mostly sunny skies. Welcome back. Here are some other stories people are also talking about today. A ceremony honored the lives of people who have died in the line of duty. The California Highway Patrol held its annual memorial ceremony to honor 232 people who made the ultimate sacrifice. Governor Gavin Newsom spoke at today's memorial, also honoring those survivors. Thank you for, you know, your faith, your devotion, your constancy, um, to your expression of love and reverence uh, to the men and women that wear the uniform, to this remarkable family, the California Highway Patrol. The memorial also included a 21-gun salute, laying of the wreath, and roll call of fallen heroes. And then hundreds of nurses from across the state marched to the state capitol today asking lawmakers to do more to address an industry-wide staffing shortage. Their list of demands includes supporting a bill that would require the state's Department of Health to enforce nursing staff ratios and a half a billion dollars to invest into nursing schools to lower tuition costs. There's going to be a whole lot of nurses retiring in the next few years. The staffing is only going to get worse. And them putting money into the schools and kind of giving a clear path into the education will really help us. And this will benefit everyone. The governor presents his final budget this Friday. So we will see then if he included additional funding for nursing schools. Sacramento is known as one of the most diverse cities in the United States, but even with that, the city continues to face accusations of racism. And it wasn't until just recently that the city is finally doing something to address its diversity. Our Jeannie Nguyen shares with us what the city has planned and what some critics think about its recent decision. In the midst of a tense time in our nation, 2020 was crazy. Sacramento firefighter Desmond Lewis was watching it all unfold while working for the city's fire department. You had COVID, you had the George Floyd post test going on. As he was trying to process what he was seeing, Lewis says some of his managers and colleagues within the fire department made it clear where they stood. I remember uh, I had a firefighter kind of feel like he was gauging me and whether or not I was, you know, on the side of the badge or the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, do I see myself as a black man or a firefighter? I had a captain say that can't these people uh, go back to shooting each other instead of protesting and uh, these people, I assumed he meant black people. Feeling like he wasn't supported at work, Lewis decided to quit and told the city why. And he wasn't the only one. Earlier this year, Sacramento Fire Battalion Chief Jonathan Burgess filed a lawsuit alleging the department fosters a culture of race-based discrimination in promoting within ranks. That lawsuit came after he claimed he was passed up for the deputy fire chief position multiple times. I believe it's very important um, that we lead by example, um, both for our community and the employees, um, to demonstrate that we're serious about the racial equity work that we're doing uh, in the city. Now the city is trying to make things right. Just last week, City Council approved a mandatory diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging training. I think it's important for our current electeds and even future elected officials to be aligned with the internal work and the external work that we're doing around race and gender and equity. Up until this point, training was available but optional for anyone who wanted to take it. With the recent criticism coming from within the city's fire department, Lewis believes the timing of this is no coincidence. Yeah, I think it is reactionary because something happened and now, <laughs> now it's a, a, a reaction to that happening. but. I'll take it. I think that either way, it's a good thing. Mayor Pro Tem Mai Vang says these initiatives started back in 2019, and there's more to it than just training. This is really about having that commitment to really uh, be in the space with, it, with intentionality and to act differently and to consistently show up uh, to address and disrupt the system that we know often too well has not been set up for many of our families and our community members. According to this resolution, the training is intended to address things like cultural competence, the history of racism, 
racism, microaggressions, white supremacy, and improving relationships across gender, race, and sexual orientation. It's aimed to be a four-hour training that happens every two years for elected officials, their staff, and appointed officers. We have department heads and we have city staff that have already taken some of the training. Uh, but our council, if you look at the fifth floor, many of them have not yet, right? And so this is a reason why uh, not just having, an, not doing an opt-in version, but making sure that it's mandatory uh, will be will be really important and critical to the to the racial equity work that we're doing in the city. Now, Lewis is back with the Sacramento Fire Department and says things are better than they were in 2020. With this new training, Lewis believes it can only benefit the city and its staff. Just respecting one another, you know. We come from different walks of life, different religions, different political views, and that's okay. We're here to do a job. Let's just be pros. Okay, and at this point, the city still needs to form and develop this training. There is no timeline on when it will be launched. Of course, we'll stay with this. All right, and make sure that you stay with us after the break because wait until you see what Jeannie's working on for tomorrow. It has to do with striking gold in the foothills. Not everyone is happy about it. That's up next. Okay, so we want to share what we're working on for tomorrow because Grass Valley was the place to be at the height of the gold rush here in California. Prospectors flocked from all over to the Idaho, Maryland mine to get their hands on the precious metal. And now there could be a new gold rush coming back to the area. Jeannie Nguyen spoke with the company that wants to revitalize the mine, but, 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 but she also discovered not everyone is on board with the plan. Once upon a time, a long time ago, Grass Valley here used to be a place where people would come to look for gold. Now, one company is trying to make that a reality again, but their efforts are getting some pushback from locals here in town. Rise Gold Corporation bought the Idaho, Maryland mine in Grass Valley back in 2017 with the intention of reopening it. Company CEO Ben Mossman says he believes there's still a lot of gold left in that mine after it was closed for good in the 1950s. Soon after the company acquired the mine, Mossman's team dug below and found gold still left in the minerals they pulled from the mine. Because of that, Mossman has put in a request with the Nevada County Board of Supervisors to allow them to reopen the mine. With gold costing more than $2,000 per ounce today. He believes there could be a big potential to expand business here at this mine. Mossman believes this will revitalize Grass Valley and bring in more revenue to the area, all while creating more jobs for locals. The people that are going to have these jobs want the jobs and they're already part of the community. So I think that's the main difference is that it's already part of the community. And the mine itself you know, has been here since the county was in Formed. County officials did release a final environmental impact report that says reopening this mine would cause minimal impacts on the water, air, and noise to the surrounding area. Rise Gold says this will be the most environmentally friendly mine. But Christy Hubbard, a volunteer with Mine Watch Nevada County, says she doesn't buy that report. Mine Watch is an organization dedicated in making sure the county does not allow Rise Gold to reopen the mine. Hubbard says she has a hard time believing Rise Gold's intentions are for the greater good for Grass Valley. Ben, we're not fooled by your advertising claims. There really is no such thing as green mining. Hubbard says there are many people within Grass Valley that also oppose this mine's reopening. Signs like this are posted up in front of homes, businesses, and also along the side of many roads. Tomorrow, the county is going to hold a public meeting regarding this company's request to reopen this mine. Now, this meeting is expected to draw a lot of attention. So the county is prepared to draw out this meeting a couple more days before they make a final decision. And Jeannie will be at that meeting tomorrow, so make sure that you tune in at 6.30 for all the updates. And you already know, we always want to hear from you and what's going on in your community, so make sure you reach out to us. We've got Instagram, Facebook, or you can just always email me and the team at abc10.com. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.
Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone, and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.